everybody. I wanted to put my picture up first just to say hello to you all. Uh, really excited to uh, have the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, Cohn, thank you again. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak last fall um, on climate change, and this is a great opportunity. So uh, I'm going to open up uh, a slideshow here for you. And uh, let's see here. Just uh, there we go. Okay. So uh, just going to move. Okay. So uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, uh, my name is Richard Hyman, and uh, I understand you all have been studying innovation and sustainability. And uh, what I'd like to chat with you today is uh, about innovation uh, by uh, this uh, famous man, Jacques Cousteau, Captain Jacques Cousteau, and his team, because uh, he did not uh, innovate everything himself. He had uh, a small team of engineers that helped him, but uh, he was uh, an innovator uh, and, and a lot of great ideas. Uh, I was thinking about innovation as I prepared to speak with you, and uh, I, I looked up a definition which uh, seemed to make a lot of sense to me, and the word that jumped out at me here was new you know, uh, the, the, the newness of something, coming up with something new is part of innovation. Perhaps that's uh, one of the words you've used as you've talked about innovation. And uh, even overnight here, thinking about today's presentation, I was also thinking about <clears throat> that to do that, you need to have imagination, you need to imagine and, and then create. Um, so uh, very interesting that you all have been working on that. I wanted to take a moment and tell you about two other things that I'm involved in because they relate to uh, education. Uh, one is a, a new uh, organization that I've started called Future Frogmen. Uh, I've I, been mentoring uh, students for about six years now, and uh, one of my mentees and I started this, and we've got uh, a number of high school and university students involved, and I envision uh, it, getting uh, middle schoolers and elementary schools involved as well over time. But we're focused on the aquatic environment, really water, uh, streams, rivers, lakes, and uh, certainly the oceans. Also wanted to mention that in, uh, in June, there's a March for the Ocean. Uh, I'm going to Washington, D.C. here in the United States, and there's going to be a big march uh about uh protecting the oceans and uh you can see some of the other countries that are also participating around the world and uh if your country is not shown there uh there's an opportunity to get involved in one way or another you feel free to reach out to me and i can connect you to the right people okay so coming back to uh innovation and jacques cousteau um as Cohn said, I did have the opportunity to work for Captain Cousteau on several expeditions. Uh, first, uh, I was a carpenter uh, building a house in Canada after I drove a truck from Los Angeles to Canada. And then I went onto the ship, uh, this famous ship Calypso. And I wrote a book about it. And uh, the reason I wanted to mention this to you students is that I kept journals, and uh, thankfully I did, because I would not have been able to remember as many details and, and written a book. So I would encourage you to keep journals uh, as you have your trips, your family trips or school trips or whatever. Um, you, you don't have to write a book, but you have the memories, which is a great thing. So talking about innovation, one of the first things that came to my mind was Captain Cousteau's ship. It was called Calypso, and uh, this was actually uh, a former military ship. It was built in the United States and then traveled to Malta and uh, was uh, used as a World War II minesweeper, but Cousteau uh, had the ability to use this ship after the war. He leased it uh, from Guinness, of the Guinness Brewing uh, family. And the cool thing about this uh, relative to innovation is that he took this ship and he added many 
features to it to make it into a scientific research vessel. Now, I will tell you, it was very slow and very uncomfortable, uh, but it, it was in a lot of television shows and movies and became a rather famous ship. Um, I, on the left-hand side of the screen, you see a, a blue arrow that I added, and I added that because that feature there, um, you can climb, Cousteau added this, and I always enjoyed this on the ship because although it was very uncomfortable, you, there's a hatch up where that arrow is, you can climb a ladder down, and then you can lay down underneath the water in a, in a bubble and look out. I'm gonna show you a picture of that in a second. Um, and then if you go back towards the, the rear of the ship, the stern, it's called, the front is the bow, the, the rear is the stern, you can see an arrow pointing down to a helicopter. So sort of an innovative thing, because I'm gonna mention in a moment that Cousteau was very much an entertainer and an educator. So uh, he had a lot of different transportation vehicles that he added to the ship to get around for transportation, but also to create uh, film and television. So there was a two-man helicopter right there on top of a helicopter pad. And then if you go further to the right, further to the stern of the ship, there's a helicopter pad, ex excuse me, um, that we already talked about the helicopter pad, but if you go back to that second arrow, you, it goes to uh, an area where a submarine was kept, a two-man submarine. So you, I'm gonna show you images of those. Here is the, the hatch I just mentioned. You see up in the upper left, the man is climbing down, and then below him is what that bubble looks like from underneath. And on the right-hand side, you can see a person laying down in there. Only one person could get in there, but uh, I thought that was a pretty innovative thing that he added to the ship. And, and it was made for uh, not only entertainment if you're, if you're on the ship sailing, but you could go down there and, and take some great photography of creatures. And here, that other arrow I pointed to you uh, is in the back of the ship, in the stern of the ship, you see below, uh, it could be opened up and there's a two-man submarine in there. So uh, that was a submarine that uh, Cousteau and his team invented, they innovated that. And uh, we also had other forms of transportation that I had mentioned, such as this PBY aircraft. This was a, a airplane that could land on the water and it's called amphibious. So it could uh, land on the sea. And uh, we use this for, uh, we call it the flying calypso. And uh, this helped us get around as well. So to me, kind of innovative additions in order to, uh, to, to make uh, film and television. Uh, Cousteau was also quite a writer and published many books about his various expeditions. Now, if we get a little more specific, probably the most famous thing that Cousteau innovated was called self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. If you see the red letters there, S-C-U-B-A, spells scuba, and you've heard of scuba gear, I imagine, and that's what scuba stands for. And on the left-hand side of the screen, you see scuba tanks. That, those are tanks that contained compressed air, and the real invention, the real innovation is in the center of the screen where you can take this regulator, it's called a regulator, and you attach it to these tanks with compressed air, and it allows the diver, allows the human being to breathe the compressed air in a regulated manner. So it's not all just rushing into their body, it comes out as they ask for it, as, they, as their breath, as their lungs ask for air from these tanks. So that allowed divers to move around underwater without being connected to a hose. In, before that, there would be a hose, uh, we call it a tether, like you were tethered to the ship. You'd have to be uh, breathing through a hose that would go all the way up to the surface of the sea and, uh, and, and reach an air supply on the ship. But now the divers were free to move about, and uh, that was a major innovation 
Cousteau also and his team innovated many other things. We, we talked briefly about the submarine. There were cameras and camera housings, and housings meaning the, con the, the containers of the cameras because you can't just take a camera down underwater, it would get ruined. You put it in a waterproof housing and uh, you, th these divers can freely move about now, not only with their tanks, but with cameras. So uh, pretty innovative uh, things. And then uh, one of the fun things were on the right-hand side, you can see these underwater scooters. So we didn't use them very often, uh, but they were handy if you needed to move about rather quickly underwater. And they were certainly something that made for uh, fun to watch on television. Uh, now uh, we, we saw, here is a diver with the scuba gear on. Over his body, he's got a wetsuit and you, the tanks we just saw uh, are on his back, and he's got a regulator and a mouthpiece uh, in his mouth, and he's gonna go actually underneath this ice. This is up in Canada uh, on my first expedition. And by the way, over his shoulder, you, you see laying down uh, a yellow uh, object with a, a piece of black on the left-hand side. That is an underwater camera, rather large, you know, it's, it's ha that's the housing and the cameras inside for motion pictures. But uh, I like to uh, compare that to today's, uh, for example, GoPros, you know? This is like an old GoPro, uh, much, much bigger and heavier. But it was still an in innovation for that day and age. So this diver goes underneath, and I just thought I'd show you what he, he was down there looking at. Uh, this was a film on beavers. So underneath the, the ice, the frozen ice in Canada, uh, this was uh, just an example of one of the expeditions. Another incredible set of innovations that Captain Cousteau uh, did in the early 1960s, early to mid 1960s, were these underwater habitats. They're like underwater kind of houses. You could live there and work there. And there were three of them, Conch Shelf one, two, and three. And I have many photographs, but I just wanted to show you a couple examples. And one reason this was extremely innovative is it was an experiment. Really, Conch Shelf one <clears throat> and two and three, what happened is they would go for longer periods of time on each one of these expeditions. Uh, the divers would be down for days and days and days without coming to the surface. They'd be living down there. So they'd stay down for longer periods at greater depths, and also more divers would would uh, um, uh, would attend. You know, the first one I believe there were four, and then there were more that were added. So the point here is the divers did not have to go uh, back up to the surface of the sea after they were going to run out of air. They could go into the habitat and live there, they could uh, refill their air tanks, but they didn't, when you go from the underwater to the surface, there is a little bit of uh, uh, science and a little bit of danger if you do not perform the science properly, because you have to get some of the gases, really the nitrogen builds up in your blood, and you have to get that out before you get to the surface. So depending upon how deep you are, you, you have to move up uh, at, a, at a, certain, uh, a certain pace. You have to let that, uh, to try to simplify it, that's, that's kind of what is going on. You, if you just go straight up to the surface, it can be very dangerous. And, and uh, the point here is that people could live and work down here without going up and down, so it's safer, but they could also get more work done. And they also perform studies on their bodies to see how it was affecting their bodies. Um, so very, very interesting and very innovative uh, for that. That was, you know, 50 years ago plus. And then uh, finally, really, Captain Cousteau was not a scientist. Uh, he would bring scientists on board that knew, uh, the best scientists in the world that knew about the creature or the location that, that was being studied. Uh, but he was a storyteller and an entertainer. And to me, that was an incredible innovation 
that uh, he brought the undersea world into people's living rooms, into people did, you know, people are still learning about the ocean today that we have an awful lot more to learn. But back in the 60s, 1960s and 1970s, we knew even less. So he was uh, interested in telling these stories and, uh, and, and bringing them to, to the television and the film. These are three films that were actually made. Uh, and the one on the left is in French there, that's The Silent World. And the one on the right called World Without Sun. Those two films are actually about the habitats we just talked about. So uh, I wanted to just share, uh, we don't have time for me to go through all the expeditions I went on. These are some of the expeditions that I went on. But uh, uh, the first one up there is in the left is a, was about the beavers in, uh, in Canada. Then the March of the Spiny Lobsters was down in the uh, Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. The fish that swallowed Jonah was in Belize, formerly British Honduras. And then the, down in the lower section is a, uh, uh, a picture of a famous Civil War, United States Civil War uh, battle between two ships. And the, uh, the one on the, uh, I've got something blocking my screen, so it's hard for me to see, but there's one there that is uh, uh, the USS Monitor. And here we go. Here's the USS Monitor. In that battle, the USS Monitor did not sink, but uh, later that year, in 1862, it was being towed from the Carolinas, from North Carolina, back to uh, back to New York, actually, and it sunk off of North Carolina in a storm. <clears throat> and we had the opportunity to to dive on that ship. And the reason I'm telling you about that is another innovation. <clears throat> what these guys are doing here is they're hanging over the side what we called we. We nicknamed it the fish, but it's, it's a technology called side scan sonar. So what you do is you see the wires are connected to a plotter, like a printer in the radio room of the ship. And the side scan sonar is sending signals to the bottom of the ocean and they bounce back and, and it's recorded on the printer in the radio room. And we can draw a picture of the bottom of the ocean. And we had to draw a picture, go back and forth, back and forth, like a piece of graph paper until we found something that looked like a ship. And that was the sunken USS Monitor. We found it and we dove on it. It's not marked by buoys and it's not marked on maps because it's actually a marine sanctuary, which means it's protected. <clears throat> you cannot freely dive on it. And uh, even though it was a warship, there was actually fine silver in China and things like that on it. So it was also being protected from salvage divers going in and trying to take that stuff. So this side scan sonar was quite an innovation for its time. And by the way, it's obviously advanced greatly now. That technology is still used today, but it, it is much more modern than this uh, old-fashioned kind of thing, but it, it was a pretty cool technology that this man actually innovated. It was not Captain Cousteau. It was this man named Dr. Harold Edgerton, who worked at MIT, the uh, university MIT in, in Boston, Massachusetts in the U.S., <clears throat> and uh, his nickname was Papa Flash. We called him Papa Flash because he invented the strobe light, if you uh, if you're familiar with uh, cameras, used to have like flash bulbs, uh, and they were they were often like strobes. And actually, you see some strobes in cameras today, but you also see them in entertainment and other types of things. This is a drop of milk uh, photographed via a strobe light and a high speed camera. Uh, Dr. Edgerton uh, had a number of very interesting photographs that uh, he and his team did, but uh, that was a very helpful innovation that we had on the ship. <clears throat> Here's just a quick photograph of what the monitor looked like underwater. And uh, by the way, this was very deep for, for uh, divers. Uh, not, you know, we could go down in the submarine pretty safely, but this was 230 feet deep, which is quite deep for, uh, for a diver. And then finally, 
Um, I'm going to show you a little bit, a little film after this, but uh, I, I just wanted to mention this. This is called the Windship. Alcyon was the actual name of the ship and uh, nicknamed the Windship. And this was a Cousteau innovation because this ship was powered by wind without sails. There's kind of like two towers there. And uh, the technology that Cousteau and his team of engineers uh, innovated uh, would power this ship. So very, very cool um, innovation. Now, what I'd like to do is show you, a, a, just to, to kind of wrap up the, the discussion, I'd like to show you a, a short video. It's not in high definition. Uh, I'm not sure how it's gonna transmit to you, but you'll see some of the things we talked about. And for those of you that, uh, uh, were, you know, a lot of you were not alive back in the 1960s and 1970s. So this might give you a little bit of a background on what we just talked about. And then I'd be more than happy to, uh, to chat with you and answer any questions you might have. So here's this video. Hopefully it will play well for us. It might take a couple seconds to get going. PM on the 20th day of April. Longitude 47 degrees east, latitude 10 degrees south. Depth 80 feet below the level of the sea. This is the coral jungle. Around the divers of Calypso, just beyond the circle of their lamps, night creatures move uneasily, stirred by the strange sight of man, the unaccustomed presence of light. Undersea explorers enter a well-ordered universe, seeking to learn its secrets, to observe and record its life, the strange, the beautiful, the tranquil, and the savage. Okay, so uh, hopefully you could see that okay. And uh, you saw some of the things we just talked about. Uh, and uh, one thing I wanted to mention to you is uh, relative sort of to innovation and creativity. Also in that video, you heard some, uh, not only some great writing, but some dramatic narration, meaning the speaker that was telling you the little story there, and uh, certainly some music. Those were characteristics of Cousteau uh, as well, and uh, pretty innovative in my mind as far as education and entertainment. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen so maybe we can have some eye contact and be happy to answer your questions. Okay. Do we have any questions? Let me take a look at the chat here. Um, hopefully you all can see me. I'm just looking at the questions here. If, uh, if you want to ask a question, you remember your microphone might be on mute. So unmute yourself if you want to chat. Okay, here's a question. Was there a climate change issue in the 70s? Uh, 
that's from Cone. Uh, yeah, it's a, a fantastic question. Uh, somebody asked me that recently as well in a presentation I gave. And um, to my knowledge, there was not much discussion or awareness about climate change at that point in time. I think there, there was concern about uh, certainly pollution and things like that. But uh, I think climate change really became more, uh, more of a mainstream discussion uh, in the 90s or later. Uh, Michael, what things did you do in school that allowed or helped you to pursue your passion and end up in this line of work? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, it's interesting. You know, my, my career has not all been in this. Uh, I've, I've uh, been doing other things as well. I've been working in the business world and mostly with technology and telecommunications. But in the last few years, I've had the freedom and the opportunity to get back more towards work in, for the environment benefit and uh, also education. So uh, uh, I've been doing more of that recently. But I think uh, I would just encourage you to, you know, pursue your education and pursue your passion. Whatever your passion is, I would encourage you to pursue that. And, and remember, you, if you don't do something as your job, as your profession, you can still be involved uh, as your hobby or as your, uh, you know, they say avocation. Your vocation is your job, but your avocation might still be volunteering or doing some other type of great work. What are your most dangerous encounters in the sea? Okay, hi, how are you? Where, hi. where are you calling from? I'm Miss Holloway, uh, Canada, uh, Mississauga, Ontario. Okay, great, great. Yeah, that, uh, that uh, the beaver expedition was in Saskatchewan. Um, the uh, most dangerous, you were saying? Yeah, um, it's funny, the, the most dangerous experience was uh, less about animals, um, the, I, but I'll, I'll try to answer your question. But the, the two scariest things for me were we were in one very bad storm when we were out diving on that USS Monitor. We basically got hit by a storm that came out of nowhere, and, and that was very scary. Um, I had to. I asked where the lifeboats were because no one had ever told me where the lifeboats were, and. Uh, the other thing was once uh, we had an electrical problem when I was diving and I got a very bad electrical shock because we'd have generators that would uh, give us electricity for our underwater lights and we had a problem there. But uh, probably the, uh, the, as far as an animal goes as a creature, uh, I'm not scared of sharks. Uh, we dove with sharks almost every day. So, and I would encourage you not to necessarily be scared of sharks. There's only a certain certain kinds that you would want to be care careful of. But on that dive on the USS Monitor, we did encounter some very large tiger sharks and they can be a little dangerous. So that was a little scary. But thank you for your question. Thank you. Feel free to, uh, how did they maneuver the wind powered ship when it wasn't too windy? Huh, how do they maneuver the wind powered ship when it wasn't too windy? Uh, yeah, now, a great question. I never had the chance to sail on Alcyon, but I believe it had a uh, supplemental uh, uh, power source, it had a supplemental engine that would have been uh, powered by traditional fuel, but I think uh, that reminds me of a question that I might pose to you all as, as a follow-up. We, you know, we don't have enough time to fully explore this together, but uh, the, uh, I see somebody want to ask a question. Don't, don't be afraid to ask a question, somebody on the video. But uh, the, the question I have for you to maybe to think about as a follow-up would be what would uh, wouldn't it have been neat to see what Captain Cousteau could have innovated today with today's new technologies, you know, and, and some of the great uh, creative people we have in the world today. 
but because uh, it was probably a little too early for solar, you know, for example, for the wind ship. But uh, I wish he was with us because it would have been very interesting. But we do have some great people in the world today that are doing their own innovation. Obviously, I'm sure you, you all have been studying some of those. I think we have a Hi. young man. Hi. Hi, I'm Kareem from Mississauga. And how did you get involved in oceanography? Yeah. Um, thank you for your question. I had uh, an opportunity. My father was actually his his career, his his job was in education, educational publishing, meaning creating books as well as television. And Captain Cousteau needed help with his business, and my father was recruited to come in and help Captain Cousteau. My father's name was Fred, Frederick. And dad was going out to California to meet with Captain Cousteau. And he asked me if I would like to go along. That was right after I graduated from high school. I was 18 years old. And I said, yes. And I went. And that night at dinner, Captain Cousteau asked me if I would help them. They needed a somebody to drive a truck from Los Angeles to Saskatchewan and then build a house up there uh, with some, uh, with some Canadian Indians. And I, I didn't know where Saskatchewan was. I like to tell uh, you young people, you know, it was before smartphones and tablets and notebook computers. And, and it was before the internet and it, and it was before Skype and zoom and so forth. So uh, I had no idea, but I said, yes. And, and, that's a message I'd like to leave with you all is, you know, don't be afraid to say yes to opportunities. Take, you know, you have to use common sense, but to, to, uh, to accept the opportunities because sometimes it might be, uh, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity. That's how I got started. And I'll, I'll also tell you that before that dinner that night in Los Angeles, California, I was at Philippe Cousteau's house. Philippe was Jacques Cousteau's son, and Philippe gave me my first scuba lesson in his swimming pool. So I went on and got professional uh, training, but uh, it's kind of funny for, for people that you know, know of the Cousteau uh, fame and reputation and all. So I got my first lesson from his son. So thank you for your question. Thank you. I have another question. Here, Ethan wants to know what was your favorite expedition? Ah, yeah. Um, I would say the most uh, uh, most exciting dive was on the the monitor, the USS monitor. Uh, that was the most exciting dive. It was very dangerous and scary, but uh, that was uh, my favorite dive. And, uh, gee, they were all, I, I liked, I enjoyed all the expeditions in different ways. I'll, I'll share that we didn't have a chance to talk about it, but when we were in Mexico off the Yucatan Peninsula studying spiny lobsters, that was fun because I, I didn't know anything about spiny lobsters. I was in university. I was able to work with a university professor and do research to help him and I learned a lot about these lobsters so it's like you you can pick any animal in the world and it can be fascinating that was some that was kind of a uh, an interesting thing for me and, and I'll volunteer one other one other thought to you all and that is that probably the most interesting thing about the entire experience for me as a young man as a boy and then a young man really was the social and cultural aspect of all these different people on this small ship because we had people just like we have on this call people from different countries different nations uh with different uh, habits different religions it was all it was all very interesting and uh, made a big impact on me it was like a little little tiny uh world if you will okay i see uh 
Okay, see another question here. May I repeat the question from Kamal? Did you discover any new aquatic species? Okay, um, not during my expeditions did we discover any new aquatic species. Uh, we were, however, always trying to find things that had not been found before, um, such as shipwrecks. Uh, we were trying to make interesting stories and, uh, and television shows, so we, we wanted to find new things that would be interesting to, uh, to the public, you know, to the viewers. Um, and that included animals, of course, like the lobsters. We studied grouper. Uh, it would be more like with a grouper, there was knowledge about grouper. That's a type of fish that was down off of Belize. But no one had ever filmed the grouper where we filmed them. And it was a very unique, very interesting uh, spot where the grouper all come together to reproduce and they come when there's a full moon. So it's all kind of interesting. Uh, it, it was science, but it, a lot of it was based upon legend. We'd talk to the local people and learn from them about what might be happening in their country, and then we'd go out and study it. Okay, I'm looking for some more questions here. <clears throat> I'll go back up on the list. Do I hear, do I, did you want to ask a question? I think you might be, okay, I thought you were muted. Go ahead. Um, we'd like to know if um, you still have your journals and um, why, how you became, like, why you wanted to journal. Yeah, um, let me see, just, I'm going to be right back. I'm going to grab one and show it to you. So here's one right here. Here's one, if you can see that, Calypso Log, 1979. So uh, I still have them. And uh, you can see that it's handwriting. You know, I didn't have a computer, a notebook computer or anything. And uh, I would just write, uh, I would just write my daily entries in here. And I, I tell you, you know, we talked about journals before. Here's one where I, I, cut, uh, I cut a map out. This is, uh, that's in Martinique, down in the Caribbean. So I'd create these little books, and uh, uh, that, that would be how I kept my memories. And I wish I wrote more. You know, I was working so hard and usually pretty tired because it would be working really hard, really sometimes all night long, but uh, at least I would write two or three or four pages a day. I wish I wrote more, but uh, that's, that's what I did with the journals. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there currently any robotic fish monitoring the ocean right now? Robotic fish? Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's a cool question. Um, there are, there are, uh, various types of uh, robots that are being used by universities. Um, some are actually like fish and some are, uh, they're called gliders. Uh, some are at the surface of the sea, some go down below and they're, they're all different types. And the, the gliders are cool because they can go for long distances underwater and then they come back up to the surface and they can communicate they can send data back to where they're from to tell about what they've studied what they've seen data might be temperature or salinity or it might be even possibly some images um, and then they also get recharged from some solar power sometimes depending upon the device but uh, they're really interesting and they're allowing scientists to go deeper for longer periods of time. You know, we talked about the habitats and we talked about divers, but uh, uh, the robots can go even deeper for longer periods of time. Thank you. Yes. 
I'm just looking here at questions on the chat, but feel free to feel free to keep asking. Okay. I see a lot of countries here that you participating. I really am excited to that you all were able to join us today. Maybe, uh, I think we've got a few more minutes. Uh, maybe I'll ask you all, any, any ideas about uh, what Captain Cousteau might have uh, been able to invent to innovate if he was with us today or, or anything that, that you all are really excited about, particularly relative to water or the ocean? when it comes to innovation. Any thoughts there? Okay, somebody's asking me, uh, have I been in one of the habitats? And if yes, for how long? Uh, I was in a habitat only for 24 hours. Uh, I, in Florida, in the US, I, I was invited uh, a few years ago. I went to a habitat with actually uh, two professors, two university professors, they were there for 72 days. They lived in the habitat for 72 days and nights without coming to the surface. That was a new world record. Uh, so that was very interesting. And they invited me to visit them. And I went down for 24 hours and we actually did a webcast from there to schools. So that, that was very interesting. Go ahead, Abby. Do you think they'll ever clean up the plastic mess in the ocean? Oh boy, that's a great question. Um, I think that uh, I think that they includes us, right? I think we all have to be involved in that too. Um, it's gonna. It's not an easy job. Uh, it, it, it's it's a mess. If you'd like to learn more about that, there's an interesting movie called Plastic Ocean that you might want to check out. Um, I'm sure there are many others as well, but it, it's a big problem. And there are some good things being done. Some innovation is happening there with different devices that collect the plastic. But uh, it seems like the plastic is going into the ocean more quickly than we're getting it out of the ocean. So I think we all have to put our heads together and work together to, uh, to do a better job with, uh, with preventing plastic going into the ocean and maybe using alternative sources of uh, packaging. But something we really should be concerned about, and, and it's a little scary, but even the plastic is getting into uh, into the fish's bodies now. So for our health, we have to, uh, we have to stop this. Okay, uh, here's a question. We talked a little bit earlier about getting the, uh, uh, I, I tried to do it rather quickly, just for the sake of time. It, it's a complicated process when you, uh, when you're going on deeper dives and you're coming to the surface, getting that nitrogen gas out of your bloodstream. Um, somebody's asked here, Menendir has asked, what process have you followed for removing the nitrogen from body before coming back to the surface? It, it's a process, it, it, it's a, there are tables, there, are, there have been created that divers use and it tells you depending upon how deep you went, and for how long you were at that depth, and it's very, you, you might not think about noise pollution, you think about chemical and oil and plastic and so forth, garbage, but there's also noise. Yeah, and there, noise pollution in the ocean, how does it affect the aquatic animals? That's what somebody, Kamal just asked. And then, uh, I think with this, Maybe this, this, yep, this boy wants to ask a question. I'm not sure on the video. Go well, on. you got, okay, there we go. Hi, my name is Pam and I have an innovation too. It's called the creeper. 
just like in the ocean, those happening in space, um, there's a tremendous amount of space junk, which is a problem to the space community. So I made an innovation, it's called the Creeper, and it will, it's a, some sort of a way to clean up space. It, uh, it pushes, it, uh, affects the, it affects, it cleans up the space junk with a, in an eco-friendly way. So here it is. Can you describe how it works, Fran Event? So this is the innovation here. Show them how it works. Hold it up for the camera. Okay, right there. Hold it up. So can you describe how your space junk cleaner works? What is this net? Uh, it's a net capture. So if stuff in space is not a um, positive charge material, it'll get caught by the net. And then the orange stuff material is, is a suction hole, like a vacuum cleaner. So it can get sucked by the space junk. Wow. And then the blue is like an outlayer of a positive, a negative charge um, magnet. So if it's a positive charge material, it can get uh, attracted to it and also get sucked. And then when it gets sucked by the suction hole, it'll get torn apart so the next component can get a better grip of destroying space junk. And the purple part is like a garbage truck crusher thing, Jig. Really <laughs> materials and then there's the storage slot where all the space junk we can reuse the materials and make brand new satellites wow so the materials will be collected to be reused yes. to make new satellites excellent thank you for sharing your project thank wow. you yeah that's fantastic yeah it's a very cool looking and uh, great description sounds like you've thought of everything with that uh, I, I i think something like that would be great for the ocean too uh, you might want to research some of the things that are, have been invented for the ocean, and uh, that, that could be uh, very helpful uh, as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So uh, I, I think we're near the end. I just want to uh, thank you all, and if anyone wants to reach out to me, feel free. Um, you can check out uh, futurefrogmen.org futurefrogman.org. Uh, my website is uh, Richard E. Hyman at uh, richardehyman.com. And if you want to communicate with me, uh, you can do Richard E. Hyman at Gmail or Richard at futurefrogman.org. Uh, I really appreciate your attention and such great questions. Uh, it's been an honor spending some time with you. Thank you so much and have a great uh, rest of your day. All right, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Christopher? Okay, Richard, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and uh, wasn't that a great webinar, people? Um, this was the last one, so thanks again, Richard. Uh, and I remember that you told us not to be afraid of, of possible opportunities, which can be life-changing, and I really second that. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, people. Bye-bye.